It's like a gun. Hi, Terry here. Welcome to another video. Today, I'm going to be starting a series on how I make black powder for use in muzzle loading firearms. Now, this video guide is going to consist of three main parts. The first part, this one, part one, um, where I'm going to talk about very briefly about the history of black powder. Um, maybe throw in a little boring science stuff about, uh, you know, what it is, how, how it's actually made. Talk about the chemicals, how to get them. Then I'm going to show you how I make charcoal for making black powder. In part two, uh, we're going to make a batch of serpentine powder. Then in part three, uh, we're going to make uh, actually a couple of batches of black powder. I'm going to show you two different ways that, uh, well, I have used both and I still occasionally use both, although I prefer one over the other. We'll talk about that when I get there. And the reason I'm making the testing a series on its own is because that's actually going to be a lot more involved than actually making the powder. I mean, I'll be comparing mine, three different kinds, actually, serpentine and two different versions of corn powder, um, against several commercial powders in different applications. So that really deserves a, a video series on its own. So this first part is really just about making the black powder. But first, let's address a couple of legality issues involved in making your own black powder. It's actually not as simple as just making all you want, going out and doing whatever you want with it. There are some rules and regulations legally that we have to follow. Now, in some jurisdictions where you live, maybe, it might be illegal to buy, possess, transport, and use commercial black powder. It may not be legal to do any of that with your own black powder. Uh, so before you start to make any, I urge you to check with the laws in your jurisdiction, the state and country where you live, and make sure that it's legal. Even here in the United States, the, the regulations can be a little odd sometimes. For example, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives categorizes black powder as an explosive, not a propellant. So 777, for example, and Pyrodex are propellants, but black powder is an explosive. Okay, so what's the difference? Apparently, the difference is the, the rate that it burns, the, how fast it burns, when it's in the open. Both 777 and Pyrodex, for example, burn a lot more slowly when in the open than black powder does. So 777 and Pyrodex are categorized as propellants, Black powder is an explosive. Now, here's the thing about explosives in the United States, especially with black powder. It is legal to make, possess, and use your own black powder as long as you're using it for your own private, non-business purposes. Now, what that means is you can make it and shoot it in a muzzle-loading firearm. You can even make it and use it in pyrotechnics so long as you're not doing it for any kind of business applications. And but for business, it doesn't matter if money is transferred or not, apparently. For example, you can't use homemade black powder to blow a stump out of your neighbor's yard. You can't sell it. You can't give it away. You can't use it for putting on a pyrotechnics display, even on your own property, if you invite other people in to watch it. And here's the kicker. You cannot transport homemade black powder off of the property it's made on without a federal explosives permit. Now, it's not hard to get a permit. Basically, you just fill out a form, pay a fee, and you get a permit. But it is illegal to transport it without that permit. So you can't make it in your garage, for example, and then jump in the car and run it down to your local shooting range to try it out without that federal explosives transportation permit. Now, you can make it and use it all you want on your own property, or you can take all of the equipment and materials and ingredients needed to wherever you're going to use it, and you can make it there 
but you can't make it in your property, transport it to another property without that permit. You can, however, buy all the uh, Pyrodex, GoX, 777, Swiss that you want, throw that in the trunk of the car, and you can drive all over the state. I have to confess, the, uh, the logic of that escapes me. But that's the law. And aside from legal issues, there is a safety warning I need to put out, of course. This following series of videos is being presented for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage, suggest, or advocate anybody make their own black powder at home. Black powder, well, you know, while we tend to think of black powder as being harmless, I mean, especially those of us who, who use it a lot in our firearms or pyrotechnics, it actually is an explosive. It is categorized by the uh, ATF as an explosive because of how it burns. It is, um, it can be incredibly dangerous if it's misused or mishandled. So you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of the risks involved. Um, if you choose to try anything that you're gonna see in this series of videos that I present, understand that you and only you are solely responsible for any consequences that might occur. Now, of the um, risks involved, the one that I think is really the most serious and the one that people tend to ignore the most is electrostatic discharge or ESD. ESD is a buildup of an electrical charge, static electricity. It's like, like when um, you drag your feet across a carpet inside your house wearing wool socks and you touch a doorknob, you know, a little spark you get, that's ESD. And ESD, will ignite gunpowder. And there are a lot of ways to generate it that you not, may not even be aware of. So it's not like, it's not like you have to handle, handle it like you're handling nitroglycerin or anything, but there are some legitimate risks. You need to be aware of those and you need to take some common sense safety precautions. And I'll discuss those as they come up in the video series. While no one really knows exactly who invented gunpowder, we do know it was invented in China around 800 AD during the Tang Dynasty. But the first written record of the formula for it doesn't appear until around the 12th century. So for about 300 years, it really was a secret known only to a handful of people. Then in the 14th century, it began making its way slowly into Europe but it didn't really become commonplace until the um, late 15th, early 16th centuries. And that's when gunpowder and firearms technology actually became powerful enough to become the deciding factor in the outcome of a battle. The very first gunpowder used in Europe was called serpentine. Okay, so why serpentine, you might ask? Well, <laughs> again, just like who invented it, nobody really knows. Uh, it might have referred to a type of cannon that was used back in those days called a serpentine, or in my opinion, more likely um, because of the, the flame and the smoke and the smell of, of sulfur and brimstone, it referred to Satan, who was often portrayed in European literature as a serpent. But however the name originated, it's used today to distinguish the early medieval style gunpowder from the more modern corned powder because of how it's made. Then around 1400, somebody figured out that when they were mixing the ingredients together to make the powder, if they added enough water to turn it into a thick paste, they could grind all three ingredients and mix together at the same time and would produce a better result. And by the 18th, early 19th centuries, the, the ball mill, the press, and the grind, and the glaze method started being used. But there's also the slurry and the CIA method. And many people granulate by rubbing their wet powder through a screen instead of pressing and grinding it. But as far as I know, uh, today the most common method, in fact, every commercial manufacturer making gunpowder today that I know of 
uses the ball mill, press, grind, sort, and glaze method. But before we make some serpentine powder coming up in part two, let's take just a very quick look at what gunpowder is, what it's made of, the ingredients needed, and how to get them. Gunpowder is a mixture of 75 parts by weight potassium nitrate, 15 parts by weight charcoal, and 10 parts by weight sulfur. And no, I did not measure these out by weight. I just put them in these bowls to show you what they look like. There are a few minor variations of that formula, um, and please feel free to experiment around with it, but that is the standard formula, and that happens to be the one that I use. I find I just get better results using the standard formula. Now, the potassium nitrate, you can get from a variety of sources. I buy mine in these handy five pound bags from Amazon Prime. Uh, you can also find it at your local hardware stores as stump remover, but you're gonna pay more for it, and it's exactly the same stuff. Potassium nitrate is used as um, well, a fertilizer um, for curing meat and for making gunpowder, so it's a very common material. The sulfur I bought in this handy 10 pound bag. Now, keep in mind that sulfur is 10% uh, by weight of the finished product. So if you want to make 100 pounds, you need one bag like this. And 100 pounds of gunpowder, quite frankly, would last me the rest of my life. So I'm set on it. doesn't matter what the prices do. As far as sulfur goes, I'm set. The potassium nitrate serves as the oxidizer. It produces free oxygen as the mixture burns. The charcoal is the fuel. It's what burns when gunpowder burns. And the sulfur serves as the igniter by lowering the ignition temperature. So the more evenly these three ingredients are mixed, the more vigorously and more efficiently it's going to burn. And there are a couple of other factors in, uh, involved with uh, corn powder, which I'll show you when we get there. So of these three ingredients, it's actually the charcoal that is the single most important ingredient in the mixture. After all, it's what burns. And oddly enough, it seems to be the single ingredient that most people new to making gunpowder take for granted or overlook. Not all charcoal is created equal. If you run off to the store, for example, and buy a bag of um, you know, lump charcoal you'd use in the grill, take it home, grind it up, and make a batch of black powder, what you get will maybe burn, but to get that flash that you probably want, you're going to need something else. The general rule of thumb is the softer the wood is, the better the charcoal used to make the gunpowder. And that makes sense when you think about it because softwood burns faster and easier and it puts out more heat than hardwood does. It just burns up quicker, which is what we want with gunpowder. Now your typical uh, grilling lump and, and brick hit charcoal that you use in your grip backyard grill is uh, made from hardwood. And that's so it will put out uh, a more even heat more slowly. So while it's great for grilling a steak, uh, just not gonna give you that kick that you want from gunpowder, especially for use in muzzle-loading firearms. So what kind of wood should you use? Well, again, in general, the softer, the better. Now that means you can use uh, alder buckthorn, um, you can use uh, cedar, eastern cedar, which I, is what I use. Um, I buy it as uh, pet bedding from my local pet stores. We'll go into a little more detail about that when I actually make some charcoal. Yeah, I am gonna make some. Um, you can even use pine if you, that's all you got. Also, I've heard dried grapevines work good. Willow traditionally um, has been the wood of choice. All throughout the, uh, the, as far as I know, throughout the 18th, 19th century, willow was the preferred wood. Now, Goex um, uses maple or used maple. If they ever get back up in production, which hopefully they are now, uh, will again use maple which actually kind of toned the, the power of the gunpowder down from what it was actually back in the 1800s. Back in the 1800s, they used willow. Willow burns a lot better. It makes a lot hotter powder. I'm still waiting for somebody in my neighborhood to um, cut down a willow tree in your yard so I can see if I can get some. Until then, uh, it's red cedar for me. But you could even experiment with 
corn cobs and coconut husks, I guess. So to make your own charcoal, you are gonna need a few things. First of all, you're gonna need wood to burn. Again, I use this Eastern Cedar pet bedding. Now this is, uh, I don't know, doesn't, doesn't have the weight on it, but I'm gonna guess it's about two pounds. It costs three or four dollars, I believe. Um, you can get like a 10 pound bag at the Walmart for $10, it's so a dollar a pound. 10 pounds will make you a lot of charcoal. And you're going to need a retort. Now that's just something where we can create an oxygen free environment where we can burn the wood into charcoal. And I'm using this little uh, steel trash can that I got from Lowe's. I believe it cost me about $20. And it's about worn out, I don't know if you can see, but it's rusted up pretty good on the bottom. These thin, thin cans like this will burn out pretty fast. If you don't want to make this much charcoal, you can also go to, say, a Lowe's or a Home Depot and just buy a plain steel paint can, like a little half gallon or one gallon steel paint can, punch a hole in the center, and there's your retort for making smaller batches. So you can see from this, I've punched four holes in the top to let the uh, volatile gases escape while it's converting. And these plugs, these little wooden plugs here, are actually just to plug the holes back up when it's finished while it's cooling down so it doesn't draw oxygen back in down into the retort, which could cause uh, you know any embers down in there to flare up, create an open flame, and could burn our charcoal up into ashes. So, as you can see also, I've already started a batch here. And this batch can originally held one bag like this full. I had this, I started this a few years ago, and then I had to stop it. And did I say a few years? I started this a few months ago, and then I had to stop it for some reason. I'm not really sure why, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and finish filling this up. So make maximum use of my heat source. And that's the other thing you're gonna need is a heat source. Now that can be an electric or gas stove. I can go outside and build a fire if you want, just cook it on that. But you are gonna want somewhere to do this outside. Remember, volatile gases means toxic gases. Do not try this in an enclosed room or building, especially without extremely good ventilation. Okay, now I'm just gonna put the lid back on this. There. And take it to our heat source. Okay, so I got my charcoal on my heat source, which is uh, an old turkey fryer. In front of a little bit of a windbreak here, just to, it's not windy, but there's a little bit of a breeze blowing through here. And don't worry about these buckets, there's nothing flammable in them. And uh, yeah, we've been, been running it now for about a half an hour. And maybe you can see it's just starting to smoke a little bit here around that vent. I plugged the other three vents up, unless uh, you know, if that one starts venting too much, it gets too much pressure, I'll pull another one off. Otherwise, uh, this entire... Uh, even longer, it, takes, it depends on how long it takes to get up the temperature. Again, the magic temperature we're looking for is 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you live in a country that uses Celsius, if my conversion factors are right, I believe that's around 316 degrees Celsius, maybe. So it's pretty hot. Wood will spontaneously burst into combustion at right around 400 degrees Fahrenheit-ish, between four and 500. But uh, that's assuming that there's enough oxygen to burn. What we're doing here is we're creating an oxygen-free environment so we can go over that temperature that wood would normally burn at without allowing it to combust into flames. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna drive off first the water that's still in the wood, then it will drive off all of the um, volatile gases, volatile chemicals, and that includes things like turpentine, tar, Halloween, uh, methanol, and all of those burn, by the way. So the other trick I was gonna show you was this one can get hot enough is that when it builds up a really nice head of steam here 
the smoke from this one vent. Once all the water has been burned out, that should burn. And that would be a good indicator that uh, we're driving off those volatile chemicals. Another way to look at it is you can just see as long as it's smoking, it's still working. So we'll see if this gets, um, builds up enough pressure to actually flame or not and find out. Right now, you can see maybe it's trying to burn. You can see how it's trying to burn, but I think it's still got too much water in it. And as far as the infrared thermometer goes, we're looking near the vent at um, 185 degrees and down near the bottom here, right at 600 degrees. So we are making charcoal, at least down at the bottom. We just gotta let it burn long enough to get up to the top. So uh, this is a half an hour. I'll be back in another half an hour. We'll see what's happening. Okay, I'm back. It's actually been about two hours now. And uh, you can see it's still smoking. And while it won't burn yet, you can see it's trying to. You see how that flame is skirting up here? It's trying to burn. It's just not building up enough pressure to let it do. And it smells like turpentine and, and tar and all that good stuff. So I've almost used up one tank of propane. It's probably going to take two tanks. This, uh, this can of charcoal is likely going to cost me about $50 to make. But uh, if my calculations are correct, I'll get enough charcoal to make retail about $300 worth of black powder. So you could say it's worth it. Yeah, I could also just chop some firewood, go out in the back, build a fire, and just stack some wood up around it, and just let it burn down for a couple hours too. The six and two threes, really. So probably looking at another two hours for that much wood chips to reduce down. As long as I can see some smoke coming out of here, it's not done. Good morning, I'm back. And yes, I said good morning. It is the next morning, morning the next day. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention when you're burning charcoal is the importance of patience. Be patient, okay? As it turns out, I only had to burn one bottle of propane to make all this charcoal. So it didn't cost me $50, it cost me about 20 bucks altogether. Um, well, 30, probably altogether. And uh, yeah, you wanna be patient on that because the thing is, one warning here is <laughs> no matter how much you're making, large, small, do not open that sucker up and look at it while it's still smoking, <laughs> okay? Remember, it's hot. Wood combusts at, and I think I said 400 degrees yesterday. Um, did a little fact checking on that. It's actually between 480, 600 degrees, say 500 degrees. There is no set temperature, you know, at that. This temperature is what wood burns at. Uh, it'll burn at a wide variety of temperatures, depending on the conditions and the wood. Can be as low as 200 degrees, can be as high as 600 degrees. But we're heating the wood up to combustion temperature or above. And the only reason it's not burning is because we're not introducing any oxygen. But that smoke that's coming out, okay, that's... Uh, volatile chemicals in gas form and they are combustible and they will burn. And if they're hot and you open that lid up, that sudden influx of oxygen, yeah, at the least you're going to get a flare up, burst into flames and all your charcoal goes up into smoke, right? At the worst, you could get what amounts to a little explosion and start a fire and get hot burning wood chips or whatever all over you and you could burn yourself or somebody standing next to you. So leave the lid on, be patient, when you're done, turn it off, let it cool down. 
Now, again, how long? I let mine cool down overnight. So that little can, I left it alone overnight. I just let it sit. Put all the plugs in, let it sit. Okay, so let me show you here up front what it looks like. Okay, we got a pretty good conversion. As you can see, there's still a few little pieces like right there. Here's a little piece of wood that didn't convert. And I just saw here's another one right here. Right there. Oh, sorry, right there. But overall, it's pretty good. There's just little pieces in it here and there. Now, there's another one. And that's what I'll do as I use it. Uh, because I don't make up large batches at time at one time and I highly encourage you do not either because the larger your batch that you're making the greater the danger greater the risks so work in small batches I'll be grinding this up in a spice grinder actually you know just a couple spoonfuls at a time and as you can see I'll be doing exactly what I'm doing now just pick out these little chips of wood that didn't burn but overall it looks pretty good and if you get a little tiny wood chip in with your charcoal it's not a big deal it's not gonna ruin the batch it'll just work better the fewer you get so yeah it wasn't a hundred percent conversion it was pretty good i mean it's that's some good charcoal i just have to you know again just pick these little pieces out as i find them as i'm grinding them up so what we'll end up with what i'll end up with we no i don't have a mouse in my pocket so what i'll end up with is some good usable clean charcoal after as I sift it out. So that turned out pretty good actually. Oh, just got a couple more pieces. Every time I see a little piece like that, I want to pick it up. Okay, got my ingredients: potassium nitrate, charcoal, and sulfur. Let's make some serpentine gunpowder. Coming up in part two, so stick around.